So yesterday we started the new chapter, chapter 17, about conjugated pi systems. And we said that conjugated systems have this alternating double single bond arrangement. And we said that they're pretty unique, mainly because most of them have resonance. And we went through an example here looking at the resonance structures. And then last but not least, we looked at the molecular orbital picture. And in order to do that, we assigned hybridization for each of the atoms in this compound. And then we remembered that sp2 atoms have that p orbital. And so if you actually draw the molecular orbital picture, you can show the resonance delocalization. So on the far left-hand side, you have two localized pi bonds. In reality, they're not truly localized because of resonance. So the one right next to it shows that that pi bond can actually be between the two interior carbons. Because of that, there's some restriction in bond rotation, right? So this doesn't spin as easily as a normal sp3, sp3 carbon-carbon bond, right? All right, so there's a really unique example of this, and we're going to see this a lot this term. And this reagent is called 1,3-butadiene. It's got two pi bonds, and it's conjugated, right? Specifically, this is S-trans. Why do we need to specify that it's S trans now? We normally don't say trans for a single bond. What do you guys think? Because it has partial pi bond character, right? So if we think about this, we normally don't differentiate between cis and trans for normal single bonds, but we know this has partial double bond character. So this is in an S trans conformation, even though it's a single bond. All right, so we do want to specify that, and I'll show you the difference. The difference is you can imagine rotating and spinning around that bond and have both double bonds facing kind of the same side. This is still 1,3-butadiene, but now this is S cis 1,3-butadiene. Right? Because now the two equivalent sides are on the same face of that single bond. So this is called an S cis conformation. All right, which one do you think is more stable and why? Left one or right one? Left one? Yeah, we know trans conformations are more stable for alkenes. That transfers over to alkanes as well. The reason they call it S trans is it's single bond trans, right? So it's just differentiating that we're not referring to the alkenes, we're looking at the single bond here. And in fact, we can actually measure this barrier to rotation. It's actually about 15 kcals per mole. And like I said, most sigma bonds rotate really easily. If you remember way back to last term, normal single bonds rotate at about 2 to 3 kcals per mole. So this is much, much higher than a normal single bond. In particular, this conformation is energetically less stable, right? If it's less stable, it's going to be more reactive. And we're going to see special reactivity with this conformation. So less stable and therefore more reactive. All right, so now we need to figure out how to make these butadienes. And there's a couple ways to make them, a couple ways to make them. And we've already learned how to do this back in first term. So let's review a little. So preparation of dienes. Let's say I already have this molecule pre-made. And I want to make 1,3-butadiene like this. What reagent should I choose? Should I use an acid? Should I throw magic fairy dust at it? <laughs> Probably a strong base, right? So this looks like an elimination reaction. So a common strong base that's used for making these is potassium terpetoxide. And is this going to be an E1 or an E2 reaction? E2, right? Because it's a strong base. So you can do this and do a simple E2 reaction. Alternatively, I'll just do it down here. You can have your dihalide 
and you can make 1,3-butadiene. And what reagents would you need to do this? Probably not NaNH2. Why not NaNH2? You'd form a triple bond in the middle. Yeah, we don't really want the triple bond. We want the bonds on the outside. So again, if we look at this elimination, we want it to be Hoffman or Zaitsa? Hoffman, right? We want it to be the less substituted position. Okay, that means we want a really big bulky base. So just like before, we want terp-butoxide in excess. And again, this is really just a double E2 reaction, but we want the Hoffman elimination products. Additionally, we can make this by reacting an alkene with what? Yeah, Br2. So there's a lot of different ways to convert between a normal alkene all the way to a diene. So for example, in this reaction, we took a normal alkene, we brominated it, and then we did a double Hoffman elimination to give us our 1,3 diene. And like I said, those 1,3 dienes are conjugated, and in the right conformation, they're quite reactive. All right, so now we got to get into the weird theoretical stuff. I'm not going to get super deep into it because it's somewhat complicated, but this gets into the molecular orbital theory behind conjugation. And if you remember back to that last page I was showing you, all the p orbitals have to be aligned in a conjugated system. That's a big takeaway. So let's look at 1,3 butadiene again that common reagent that we know how to make. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw this using an MO picture. So we've got four carbons. Each of them are sp2 hybridized. I'm not even going to bother drawing into the hydrogens just to keep this neat and tidy. Molecular orbital picture, right? So we're looking at the orbitals. Oh, sorry, I forgot my E. There we go. That looks better. And in the conformation I have shown, we've got pi bonds right here and right there. But we know in reality they can delocalize along the entire system, right? And so what we can do is we can look at this using molecular orbital theory. And this is kind of what molecular or orbital theory is describing, is how those electrons are filling various molecular orbitals, right? So in its ground state right here, in the bottom, all of the p orbitals are aligned and they're in the same phase. If you remember back to gen chem, the top lobe of a p orbital is going to be opposite phase of the bottom lobe, right? So in this case, the lowest, most stable configuration is when all the phases are aligned. However, you can only fit two electrons in that orbital. We know each hybrid molecular orbital can fit two electrons, so we can pop those in. And then in the next one, we can't fit more electrons in, so we have to create what's called a node, and that's when you have a phase flip. So if you look right here, we've got a node in between. That's our phase flip, where the left-hand side p orbitals are now upside down in terms of phase compared to the left-hand side. And if we look at that, we can now fit two electrons in it. And so those are all four of the electrons in our pi bond system. Theoretically, we've got a higher energy orbital where we've introduced a new node, so one here and one here. So you can see there's two phase flips in the interior part of the conjugation. And then even above that, we have a theoretical level where we have three nodes, where every p orbital is a different phase compared to its next door neighbor. Does that make sense? So it's confusing. We're not going to get into the physics behind it all, because you could spend like a year studying that. And if you go on and take physical chemistry, you will. Um, but we're not going to do that here. I did want to introduce some terminology, though. This orbital right here is called the highest occupied molecular orbital. Most people just call this HOMO, right? It's just easier than saying highest occupied molecular orbital to everybody. And that's this orbital right here. It's the highest energy orbital that still has electrons in it. Above that, though, we've got this orbital that's empty. And this is called our lowest, I'm going to slide this over, unoccupied molecular orbital.
Therefore, people just call this the LUMO. And what's interesting about these is this distance between these two orbitals in terms of energy is relatively low. That means if you shine the correct frequency of light with the correct amount of energy, you can actually knock one of the electrons from the HOMO level into the LUMO level. And that's what gives a lot of compounds their color, right? So if we think about colored compounds, back to beta carotene in lab, that was a highly conjugated system. The more conjugation you have, the more red shifted things become and they get redder, right? Less conjugation you have, the more blue shifted they become, they get bluer. Sometimes they're so blue shifted, they, they have no color altogether because it's in the ultraviolet region that we can't see, right? So we're really interested as organic chemists in this homo and lumo gap between each of these levels. That tells us a lot about each of these. All right, let's look at an even more complicated system because it's fun. <laughs> if we think about this one, right? I'll draw the MO picture. Let me slide this down. We've now got six carbons. So this is a triene. They're all sp2 hybridized, so we've got p orbitals in all of them. And the way we have it drawn in the Lewis structure is we've got pi bonds alternating between all the single bonds, right? Again, we can look at this using that crazy ladder system that we just saw. I'm not going to really push this much further, but I did want to show it to you. So if we look at this one, we've got three total pi electrons. Like I said, the lowest energy level is when all those p orbitals are in the same phase, so they're all perfectly lined up with one another. And you can fit two electrons in this orbital. And then, like I said, the next energy orbital has one electron, or sorry, not one electron, one node in between where there's a phase change, and you can fit two electrons in there. Next one has two nodes right here and here. We can fit our last pair of electrons in there. So like I said before, what is this called? Homo. It's our HOMO, highest occupied molecular orbital. And then above that, we've got three nodes. Above that, we've got four nodes. And above that, we've got five nodes. And up here, we said this is referred to as our LUMO. This gap compared to the last one is actually smaller due to more conjugation, and that's why it gets redshifted. So more conjugation. Equals smaller. Homo. Lumo gap. Another way of thinking of this is it's redshifted. So typically, compounds, like I said, with a lot of conjugation appear more red. Compounds without much conjugation appear in the blue region or are not visible at all. All right, I think that's as far as I'm going to push this molecular orbital theory stuff because we got to get into some new reactions. Are there any questions, though, before we move on? No? All right. So we're going to do more addition reactions. It feels like we're going back to chapter 9. But the cool thing with this is you can actually predict the reactivity of this. So let's assume we've got one equivalent of hydrobromic acid. Let's do our electron pushing. Check with your neighbor and see if you're anticipating the correct product or products from this reaction. Assume that there's one equivalent, not in excess. Good question. Give me a thumbs up if you feel good about it. A few people. All right, let's get started then and at least work our way there, right? So first step, we know our pi bond. Can grab this proton, kick off bromide. The question now is will that blue proton go to the green position over here or the red position over there? The what? So the, the hydrogen, where will the hydrogen end up? Where the red arrow is pointing or the green? On the red one, right? 
Why is that? Positive charge is more stable, right? It's a secondary carbon versus primary. Is there anything else stabilizing it? The resonance, right? That's key. So we can push this around. We can say this carbocation is resonance stabilized. And when we do this, we can have a positive charge delocalized across two carbon atoms. Makes sense, right? All right, each of these resonance structures is reactive, right? So if we've got bromide floating around, the bromide could attack either the top face or the bottom face of that carbocation, if you remember, right? So let's draw the product for this side. So the bromine could get installed as a wedge or a dash, I'll just write plus en down here to indicate that that bromine could be in either an R or S configuration, right? Alternatively, over here, we could have the bromide attack the end carbon. And our product would look like this. Do we have to worry about an antimers now? No. So in reality, we could theoretically get three total products out of this reaction, right? One set of enantiomers and then a different constitutional isomer. All right, now the tricky question. Which product is more stable, the left set of products or the right product, and why? So how do we determine stability of alkenes? Be the right one, right? And why? It's in the middle. If you remember, alkenes get more stable the more substituted they are, right? So if we think about the alkene on the right, it's di substituted, where the one on the left is mono substituted. That means that this one over here is the more stable alkene. Therefore, it's going to be considered our thermodynamic product, right? So you remember back to first term, we said thermodynamic products are just your most stable product. How do we favor formation of thermodynamic products? High temperature or low temperature? What do you guys think? So going back to last term, I know it was a while ago. I'll give you a hint. Thermodynamic has thermo in the name. That means heat probably favors it, right? So this is favored at high temps. Kind of, if you remember back to last term, we were talking about kinetic products versus thermodynamic products. We said thermodynamic products, you don't care about the activation energy or how they get there. You just want to form the most stable product. That is your thermodynamic product. Kinetic product, on the other hand, is what? It's not necessarily the most stable product. It's the one that has the lowest activation energy, right? So if we look at the one on the left-hand side, do you think that's going to be our kinetic product? Probably, since we're comparing them. So, <laughs> so let's take a look. This is our less stable alkene. And in this case, it is our kinetic product. But now we have to think about why it's the kinetic product. And... Imagine that first step of the reaction, right? You protonate, that bromine gets kicked off, it's now bromide. It's floating right around this area of the molecule, right? Versus on this side, it would actually have to move over a few carbons to find the carbon it needs to attack. And because of that, it's actually easier for the bromine to attack the carbon it's closer to after it does that initial proton transfer. 
So the way I like to describe this is it's the kinetic product because the bromine, or bromide I should say, doesn't have to float as far to attack the carbocation. Float's not really the scientific term, but it makes a good mental image. I'll show you some examples later, but kinetic products are always going to be the one where the bromine or halogen attacks the closest available carbocation. The thermodynamic product is just your more stable alkene. All right, so there's also some new terminology we have to learn. I'll show you guys a really, really simple tool, though. If we look at the product on the left-hand side, do you notice how the hydrogen that was installed is right next door to the bromine that's installed? So what people do is they say, this is carbon one, this is carbon two. So they refer to this as one, two addition product. If we look at the other one, they're separated by four spaces, right? So this is referred to as 1,4 addition. It can be pretty confusing to keep track of these. That's why I really like using colored pens or pencils. You can actually color code the hydrogen that was added in, compare it to the halogen that was added in, and then count the spaces in between them. 1,2 addition means a two carbon spacer. 1,4 addition means you've got a four carbon space spacer. Yep? Why not you? Why not count? We're only interested in the spacing between the hydrogen that was installed and the halogen, right? So the left-hand side, there's a two-carbon spacer. The one on the right, it's a four-carbon spacer. The numbering is not the same numbering we would use for naming. That's completely different. We're just counting carbon spacers. Yep. All right, so let's briefly review kinetic versus thermodynamic products. All right, and so we've got to go back to this chart, a reaction coordinate diagram. And over here, we had the same starting materials for both reactions. We had our 1,3-butadiene and hydrobromic acid, one equivalent. We said one product's more stable than the other. So I'll draw that down here. And then the other ones up here, it's a little bit less stable. So I'm going to show this one actually in blue, just so we can keep track of everything. And we would end up with the mixture of enantiomers for that blue product, right? So the top one, is that 1, 2 or 1, 4 again? It's our 1, 2 addition product. The bottom ones are 1, 4 addition product, right? And we said the 1, 2 addition product is our kinetic product. That means it has the lowest activation energy. And the black one must have a higher activation energy, but it gives you the more stable product, right? So let's make a note of this, that kinetic products has a lower activation energy, whereas the thermodynamic product whoop, is just simply your most stable product. You don't care about how it got there. So they're looking at very different things. The thing they're looking at with thermodynamic products is basically the delta G, right? Where with kinetic products, you're looking at activation energy, meaning how large is that hill that you have to climb to form your transition state. Does that make sense? A little bit of review. Let's try a couple practice problems. 
And I'll give you guys some time to work on this, but try to check with your neighbor. Let me double check that this wasn't on the pod. All right, sometimes I accidentally reuse pod problems that's in class ones, and that's never fair. All right, so we've got this cyclohexene derivative, right? We've got HBr, but this time we're gonna run the reaction cold. I want you to determine what your major product will be and what your minor product will be. All right, I think most people are getting close. So let's do the first step, right? Doesn't really matter which bond you start with, they're chemically identical. So I'm just gonna use the top one for the sake of argument. And now we've gotta decide which position that blue hydrogen will get installed onto. Will it be this position on the top or the one on the right-hand side? The top. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and install my blue proton right there. And we know that that's the most likely position because not only are we getting a tertiary carbocation, but it's resonance stabilized. So let's draw both resonance structures. So both resonance structures, we've got that. Now we've got bromide floating around can attack either one of those carbon positions. So we'll do this one first. And it's important to remember it can attack, uh, attack the top face of the carbocation or the bottom face. So for example, I'll do the bottom one first. And then we'll also have an enantiomer. And then the blue proton we know is going to be right there. Makes sense. And then let's do the one on the right-hand side. Same thing, it can attack the carbocation. Oop, let's keep this blue. And this can attack from the top face or the bottom face. So again, we'd end up with a mixture of enantiomers. All right. So now we need to assess which one's going to be our more stable alkene. What do you guys think? The right hand one, right? Because it's tetra substituted versus tri substituted, right? So this is the more stable alkene. Therefore, it's your thermodynamic product. All right, now the next question I have for you guys is which one is one two addition? Is it the left-hand side or the right-hand side? Yeah, left-hand side is one two addition. The right-hand side, if we remember, we can say this is one, two, three, four carbons away from one another. So this will be our one four addition product. All right, and then over here, we know that this is our less stable alkene. It's our 1,2 addition product. Oop. And we know the 1,2 addition products are our kinetic products because that bromide is gonna be pretty dang close to that carbocation. It doesn't have to float around to the opposite side of the molecule before attacking. So this would be our kinetic product. All right, so now we've got to determine which of these will be major and minor. What do you guys think? Major's on the left, why? Yeah, exactly. So Deja was saying the left-hand one is gonna be our major product because we really don't need much activation energy. The bromide is right next door. It can attack that no problem. So this left-hand side will be our major product.
the right hand side will be our minor product since we're running it so cold it's going to have a little harder time forming that one even though it is the more stable alkene does that make sense you guys want a hard one all right let's try a hard one same sort of thing i want you to determine which products could be formed and then assess which ones your one two versus one four which one's kinetic thermodynamic, major, and minor. All right? I would argue the biggest challenge in this one is physically drawing the ring because it's a seven-membered ring. Not a six-membered ring, but a seven-membered ring. Looks like this. Seven-membered rings are hard to draw. <laughs> yep. So we're doing this reaction hot rather than cold. All right, let's do this. So we know it's symmetric. It doesn't matter which side we attack with. In fact, usually the starting materials for these types of reaction are symmetric. If they're not symmetric, you could run into a whole range of different options, which kind of makes things difficult. So because it's symmetric, I'll just pick this one. Kick off bromide. Now the question is, over here, are we going to put the hydrogen on the bottom carbon or the top carbon? Yeah, it would have to go to the top one, right? So we'll leave this double bond as is. We want the carbocation to be resonance stabilized. Resonance is more powerful than secondary versus tertiary, right? So in this case, even though it's secondary, it's resonance stabilized. That's a huge stabilizing feature. So let's draw the resonance structure. We know in both of these, we're gonna have the blue hydrogen in the same spot, but we can delocalize the electrons down here. And in fact, in the second resonance structure, we actually have a tertiary carbocation, right? Make sense? All right, same sort of thing that we did before. We'll say the bromide can attack into this carbocation, which means the double bond will be localized here. Blue hydrogen's over here. And I'm not even gonna draw the stereochemistry, but how many stereocenters do we have? What do you guys think? Got a stereo center here, stereo center here. How many potential products could come out of that side of the reaction? Four, right? So two to the N, right? Two to the two is four possible products from this reaction. All right, let's do the same thing for the right-hand side. Bromide can attack there. Whoop. We still have this blue proton hanging out over here. We've got the double bond down here. And I've got my bromine now coming off this other carbon. All right, just like before, we have two stereo centers. So four potential products for that right-hand side. It's getting pretty complicated. All right, next question. I'm gonna just zoom down a little bit. Which one's our major product, left or right? Let's even step back further. Which one's our thermodynamic product? meaning most stable product, mm -hmm. left. So this is more stable alkene, simply because it's tri-substituted, where the one on the right is di-substituted. That means that this is our thermodynamic product. All right, if we look over here, we'd say this is the less stable alkene. All right, now let's go back again and ask, all right, which one's our one, two addition product? Is it the left-hand side or the right-hand side? The left. left one. This one, therefore, is one, four addition. All right, now the tricky thing, which one's our kinetic product? Right, let's think about that. We said up here, 
that the kinetic product is the one where the bromine attacks at the closest position where it delivered the hydrogen, right? So which one must be the kinetic product? The left one. Okay, so if we look at this, this confuses the heck out of students because they say, wait, how can you have both a kinetic product and a thermodynamic product? Sometimes that just happens, right? So in this case, this product over here, we're really going to get very little of. This would be super minor. In fact, we might not get any at all. This is definitely going to be our major product. So that kind of leaves me with our takeaway point from these reactions. Your kinetic product is always going to be 1, 2 addition. Your thermodynamic product is going to be your most stable alkene. If you notice, I didn't say that your thermodynamic product is going to always be your 1,4 addition product. 1,4 addition is just arbitrary at that point. So the key takeaway is your kinetic product is always 1,2 addition. Your thermodynamic product is your most stable alkene. And I'm going to put an asterisk here and say that sometimes your kinetic product is also your thermodynamic product. Does that make sense? It's a confusing but really important distinction, right? Kinetic product just means it's the most accessible. Thermodynamic product means it's the most stable. It has nothing to do um, with 1,4. So big takeaway from today's lecture. All right, that's where we're going to stop today. Next week when we come in, we're going to start looking at pericyclic reactions and the Diels-Alder reaction. So if you want to start reading ahead or watching videos ahead, you can.